You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Center Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their current inventory of classic vehicles. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. This is show number 76 for July 2019. We're recording a week earlier than usual as I will be on vacation, and I'm hoping that the Defender document leaks can also take a vacation. That might be nice, right? A lot of- <laughs> <laughs> I'm your host, John Costage. Joining me over Skype is Dixon from the great northern country of Canada. Welcome, Dixon. Great white north. That's very warm right now, and not very white. So, so is uh, so is the great United States. It's uh, most of the country is awash in heat and humidity, which we are not made and designed for. Certainly, I'm not made and designed for. I'm thinking that's why Harold's not with us. He was supposed to join us, and we tried to call him a couple times. He maybe he'll jump in the middle of the show here. I'm hoping he didn't collapse in his garage <laughs> from the heat. <laughs> Harold, let us know. Hope you're okay. Our guest this month is Dan Warden, who manages the One Ton Land Rover website, one of the rarest production Land Rovers, which there's only about 700 manufactured, about 60 survive, and there's probably 10 to a dozen are still on the road. And Dan has put a lot of hard work into documenting and archiving the technical information of these very rare Land Rovers. So we'll talk with him later in the show. That was actually a cool conversation. I learned a lot of good stuff there on, on the One Ton Land Rovers. and what is and what isn't, which I'll, I'll give the listeners a heads up. It's uh, not exactly clear. <laughs> well, there's at least one in North America. Yes. Oh. So they are very rare. That's right. And as you'll hear in the conversation later, Dixon, you need to let Dan know about that one in Nova Scotia. I hope, hope you've done that. I have done that. And thanks for your comments, follows, likes on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and email. Thanks for your support through Patreon, donations, and merchandise sales. I sent out a couple stickers in the last last couple weeks. One just went over to the UK, as a matter of fact. To directly support the show, visit our website to purchase t-shirts, stickers, and links to the pa- link to the Patreon page. You can find all the details about our Patreon from our website. The Bells, Graham, Louisa, Keelan, and Jessica have arrived back home in South Africa. And I think they're taking some well-deserved time to themselves to rest, and then they're going to figure out what they're going to do. I have not reached out to Graham yet to get him on the show to talk about things and give us an update. And yesterday here in Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania area, was a Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix British Car Day, even though it was unbelievably hot, melting, blazing hot. Although actually I don't think it was hot as last year. Last year I felt more beat up when the event was over and this year I didn't and I think there were two reasons for that one I didn't drink any alcohol during the day (laughs) I had the same amount of water which was good but this year even though they were calling for the super high humidity and super high uh, heat there was still a good amount of cloud cover and then there was a breeze and that that breeze made a big difference It was nice. But there are a lot of a lot of cool cars. I did post some pictures uh, on my uh, Flickr page, and I posted that to the Facebook page and Twitter of uh, the Center Steer account. So if you want to take a look and see some of those. The uh, <laughs> little interesting thing about the event, they have different categories of vehicles. And we're in the British car section run by uh, uh, the Triumph, Western Pennsylvania Triumph Club. And they have you know, winners for different categories, different groups. And Land Rovers are broken into two. There's the Discovery Range Rover and Range Rovers slash a Freelander. I, oh, I should tell you. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And then there's the Series and Defenders in another group. A Series truck won in the, in the Disco group because they had mis- registered their vehicle they came last year in a disco and this year they came in their series but somehow their series got put in a disco anyway so so a series truck won both the series defender group and it also won the discovery range rover group 
the other thing you're missing for the warm temperature is that for a series truck, like my 80-inch at the All British Car Day yesterday, it's good for fuel economy because I could start it up and run it without having to use the choke. It was so hot. <laughs> there you go. See? There's another bonus. And also yesterday, I did see, I think now, the seventh functioning Freelander in North America. This was a G4, four-door, G4, five-door, uh, G4 edition Freelander. I don't think it was the one I saw in Virginia earlier this year. I believe it was a different one. I didn't get a chance to talk to the owner because they, they pulled up and got out of their car and took off. They didn't come over and talk to us as we were sitting under the outrageously large awning. I'll have to report that to the Western Hemisphere Area Freelander Enthusiast, Enthusiast Society, WAIF. Wait, that there's actually seven in the hemisphere that might be working. And I can confirm, I think almost, uh, I think six of those. We need to get him on the show. We should have him on the show. Is the uh, I still would maintain there's probably more 80 inches in Ottawa that are running than Freelanders in the hemisphere. I, know, I love that. I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into the news. So sales in the U.S. were down for JLR in June. Overall sales were down 9% on, uh, for June 28, uh, versus June 2018. Sales for Land River models fell. 6% Jaguar sales fell 20% for the first half of the year. JLR though is up an increase of 5% from before they sold over 62,000 units versus just under 60,000 units last year. Jaguar is up 10% and Land Rover is uh, up 3% in the U S for the first six months. Sales of the new Range Rover Evoque were up 16%. For the half year, Range Rover Sport continued to be the brand's sales leader with uh, over 12,000 units sold. The Midlands-based company saw, said global sales fell 11.6%. Vehicles in the first three months to June uh, 30 compared with the same period last year. Well, that's not monthly. That's 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 a quarterly thing. The sales of Land Rover, which represents 70% of output, sank 12%. Things are slowing down in their negativity. Is that a good way to put that? That's a good way to put it. Okay. Things are stabilizing. The UK car industry future hinges not on Brexit, but on batteries. And I'm just reading parts of this article from The Guardian. Uh, yet amid the congratulations, Spaith also struck a note of warning, as we know Spaith is in charge of a Land Rover, of a JLR. Not on Brexit this time, but on the future of the car sector in the absence of a British battery industry. Quote, one thing is clear, if batteries go out of the UK, then also the automotive production will go out of the UK, he said. The opportunity for a global industry enjoying explosive growth is enormous, and without battery industry, the jobs of 11, 100 14,000 workers making the UK's combustion engines would disappear by 2040, the government-backed uh, Faraday Institution warns. Uh, by then, the UK will need annual battery capacity of as much as 200 gigawatt hours, 100 times more than current production, if it fully grasps the opportunity to make batteries for the UK's 1.8 million vehicles. That would be equivalent to 13 of what Tesla founder Elon Musk labeled gigafactories, those capable of 15 gigawatt hours a year or more. The UK has already missed out on one shot of having a world-leading battery industry. The lithium-ion battery was invented at Oxford in the 70s, but uh, Sony, out of Japan, ended up commercializing the technology, which I didn't know that. Neither did I. It's going to be quite a challenge for the various nation-states to go and develop all the battery technologies and something. You know, you've got the Germans, you've got the British, you've got the Americans, the Chinese. It's going to be a race for raw materials and so on it'll be very interesting to watch yeah and it's uh i i take it the dog is that it's for our listeners that's that's uh dixon's dog that you hear rustling in the background yes there <laughs> when i'm editing i hear it and then i you know i'm like can i cut it out no because there's usually something interesting said i'm trying to get the two of them down to lie down and now they're being calm oh you have two dogs i thought you only had one. Oh yes Black and white, oh. Ivy and Holly, oh. Holly and Ivy. Nice. Well, that's good. Okay, well, we shouldn't, let's not disturb them. <laughs> JLR signal faith in electric revolution with one billion pound factory. So JLR will invest almost one billion in building electric cars in the UK, despite an industry-wide drop in sales of low emission vehicles. Ministers announced a plan in May 2018 to ban the sale of new diesel and petrol only cars by 2040. That's for the UK. And an even more ambitious target of 2032 was pledged by the Scottish government. 
I've added that now to our list. Dr. Spaeth uh, said on this one, quote, the future of mobility is electric, uh, is electric. And as a visionary British company, we are committed to making our gener next generation of zero emission vehicles in the UK, unquote. So there you go. Batteries, batteries, batteries. It's visionary. I hope it works. But <laughs> there's few challenges that are going to have to be worked out there. Can you deliver that charging power to my household in the suburbs without changing too much of the infrastructure? Or make the charging as quick and convenient as it is with gasoline or diesel? Oh, hey, there's that $1.7 million uh, Lotus that will recharge the whole thing in 18 minutes or less. Requires 550 volt to your house, but can be done. And then along those lines, this came out a couple of days after that announcement. The This announcement was that the UK guarantees Jaguar loans after a pledge to make electric cars. JLR won a £500 million loan guarantee from the UK government just over a week after announcing a new range of electrified cars will be made at a plant in central England. JLR will invest hundreds of millions of pounds, transforming its Castle Bromwich site near Birmingham after previously committing to electrified options of all new models from 2020, the first electric vehicle off the production line will be the ninth generation of Jaguar's flagship XJ Saloon. So it looks like we have Jaguar, JLR saying they're putting a billion pounds into electrification, and then the UK government seems to be helping this out, this effort out, by giving them a half million pound loan. Does that, does that seem like, uh, am I picking up what they're putting down? Yep, and it makes a lot of sense strategically for the uh, the country. You got to go and go down the road. You know, potentially all these new jobs are not going to be the people that are losing their jobs with the internal combustion engines, but you're going to keep job and industry in the Midlands and in the UK. And you're going to be expanding into the next frontier of technology also. You know, That's right. Instead of just letting it fizzle. Speaking of engines, JLR engine boss on new Ingenium Straight 6. And there's some good stuff here to read, some technical things. I think it's pretty good. So the uh, Range Rover Sport has been in production for six years and still remains one of the strongest and most acclaimed models in the size class. In the case of the L4, L494, I assume that's the Sport designation, there has been one facelift and a series of uh, engine changes, the latest of which is the arrival of JLR's self-developed six-cylinder Ingenium engine. It's also available in the, in the full-size Range Rover. This replaces a less powerful supercharged V6 sourced from a Ford plant in South Wales. All production is at what Jaguar Land Rover calls EMC Engine Manufacturing Center near Wolverhampton in the uh, Midlands. Build of four and six-cylinder engines takes place on the same line. Two versions, mild hybrid, plug-in hybrid of a 1.5 liter three-cylinder petrol will be the next to join this modular family. According to JLR's Liam Taylor, who is, whose title is Senior Manager Engine Programs, planning for the straight six started in 2013, quote, running in parallel with the back end of the four-cylinder program, unquote. Why so long gestation period until the arrival of the six? Quote, we spent quite a long time in the concept phase working through, should it be a V6? Should it be an I6? We developed concepts for both, then looked at what would be the best concept for Jaguar and for Land Rover, unquote. Further, he said, quote, we made the decision to go for a straight six cylinder for various reasons, one of which is the primary balance and the obvious refinement of the inline layout. We could also use the technologies that we developed in the four cylinder engines. So for instance, all turbocharging and the hot stuff on one side next to the after treatments, valve train parked on top, Whereas in a V8 engine configuration, the valve train leans over to 45 degrees, so that means the cars have to be a lot wider. With this inline six, you have all that cooling on the other side of the engine, unquote. As JLR is yet to make any official statement about the existence of an Ingenium 6 diesel, Taylor wouldn't be drawn on any details of this engine. The internet is awash with rumors and specifications, even down to the supposed variant name in L663, the next Defender, being D300. Outputs of 300 PS and 650 NM are claimed from what will reportedly be a three liter unit. One thing we do know in regard to engine programs is JLR's take on what happens to be the supply of the petrol V8 produced at Ford's Bridgen plant. As news that facility's closure broke, the company told the media it has a contractual agreement with Ford for the supply of engines until September 2020, and will work closely with the Ford team to ensure certainty of supply through the end of the contract period. 
It would be strange if JLR hasn't already got a strategy in hand to replace the supercharged 5-liter V8. That will surely mean larger cubic capacities and or far more powerful versions of the new 6. Liam Taylor chooses his words carefully when pressed on a reply for that. Quote, I can't talk about future product strategy. What I can say is that there is a place in the market for a high-performance engine. The V8 we currently have takes us up to 575 horsepower. As a company, we need to make sure that we look after our customer demands while also meeting all emission requirements, unquote. It's going to be very interesting to see how it develops. I was surprised that they said that the engine hadn't been officially announced. I thought it had, but maybe maybe I missed something in all the in, in engine announcements. Well, there's so much information about the Ingenium wash on the internet. It's hard to tell when it is officially <laughs> announced and not announced. But it also sounds like they're not going to produce a, a V8 or or I suspect even an I8. Uh, sounds like 6 is going to be the the largest they're going to produce. Well, they're being very tight-lipped about that at this point in time. This article came out a few days later, or maybe it was nine days later. It almost seems like in uh, opposition to the previous article. JLR and BMW to extend alliance plans. So the recently agreed alliance between JLR and BMW is set to is set to be extended to include internal combustion engines, a source with knowledge of the recent high-level decisions between the car makers has told Autocar. The two firms initially agreed to work together on the development of electrified powertrains, but according to sources, they now have agreed terms on what is described as a more far-reaching deal involving petrol, diesel, and hybridized drivetrains for a wide range of models. According to auto car sources, BMW is to supply JLR with internal combustion engines, including the inline four and six-cylinder units, both with and without electric electrically assisted hybrid functions, the move is said to be aimed at allowing JLR to reduce its ongoing investment in petrol, diesel, and hybrid drive lines, and instead focus its research and development spending on the electric drive lines in partnership with BMW. Which is probably a good thing, considering the chairman of BMW just was not renewed for another term in office because of failure on the BMW side of coming up with something that is adequate for electric vehicles. Yeah. And... And then you've got, which is the, what also makes this uh, alliance interesting, is at the same time, you've got Volkswagen Audi Group getting in bed together with Ford on electric vehicles. So it's interesting to see how the alliances and so on are starting to uh, fall out with the change over to electric uh, vehicles. Obviously, it's not as easy a thing to go and do as some of them were saying a few years ago. That, yeah, that, that was what I was thinking, too. When you've got some these rather large companies, the big ones ha, uh, kind of struggling and, and going into alliances with other large companies, and then you have a relatively smaller manufacturer like JLR, they definitely need to pair up with someone. It it's definitely seems to be a challenge. Yeah, it's too bad they didn't get together with Volkswagen, in a sense, because Volkswagen does have its act together when it comes to building on different platforms. Land Rover seems to be going down that road, but they're not executing it as well as uh, Volkswagen Audi has done, at least in my opinion. Yeah, it, it almost seems like they've been focused a lot more on the platform than on the the engines, and and maybe it's simply because they didn't have the funds and the and of course we've had this financial downturn where they were working on those modular platforms and they were preparing them for different configurations, and they probably I'm just as a you know pure guessing here. I'm not even this is not even reading between the lines. This is all just guessing guesswork on my part. That they probably said, oh well, we you know we'll start on the modular platforms, and then next year or next cycle we'll work on the engines that fit in those. And then they had that economic difficulty, and now they're saying now maybe the best way, to, best place to go is to partner with uh, BMW or someone else. In terms of investment wise, it makes a lot of sense. At the end of the day, these things are all going to be the same, right? Pretty much. You're also going to want to come up with a standard for charging because, heaven forbid, you have three different connectors and, you know, this company has a certain kind of connector to charge and this company has a different one. And then you can get efficiencies, of course, out of having some commonality across the uh, across the industry. I'm hoping that happens sooner than later. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And uh, moving on, this is uh, nothing in production, but it's just kind of an interesting article, you know, I find certain things interesting. JLR is testing a mood sensing AI system. So JLR understands, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to read the whole thing here, but JLR understands that driving can be stressful. The British automaker points out in a recent press release 
that 74% of people admit to feeling some form of stress every day. I'm like, okay, of course they do. Anyway, that's why it's been developing a mood detection system that uses AI-powered tech to track facial expressions and implement subtle changes to help restore some tranquility to the driving experience. Until your passenger goes and changes the radio station from your, your classic, uh, <laughs> classic rock to yeah. disco or something, and then we'll see how the system reacts. Well, that that would be stress-inducing right there, would it not? You know? Oh, yes. It's an interesting tangent they're, they're taking. I'm not sure why, but okay. It's, it's interesting. My take on it is that it's, of course, I mentioned the AI system, all these sensors and things are on there. I think this is just the inevitable where we're going uh, of the driver not driving, that there's, you know, you're not going to need a driver. And eventually, you know, it may be 20 years down the road, but I think eventually the driver will be eliminated. The human as a driver will be eliminated. And this is a part of that path of taking us to that path, you know, detect that someone's entered the vehicle and what's going on. And there's some good uses actually possibly out of this, that if you are in a um, taxi, which eventually will probably all be taxis, I would suspect, you know, it might detect that you uh, are having some medical emergency and it could just drive you straight to the hospital. Oh, autonomous driving is going to be quite interesting. It'll just absolutely revolutionize the driving experience so long as it's not like the taxi and uh, total recall. Actually, it's going to eliminate the driving experience. It will revolutionize transportation. <laughs> it's going to eliminate yes. the driving experience. Former Jaguar design chief Callum launches new company. So he says he did not want to work for, in corporate OEM anymore and went out on his own, but he's still working. He said he's 64 and he has 15 years left of designing in him. And he left uh, Jaguar on July 1st. And he has been credited with modernizing Jag's retro image. Among his Jaguar designs are the F-Type, the F-Pace, and the electric I-Pace. Before he was with Jaguar, he was at Aston Martin. And he was responsible for the Vanquish, the Vantage, and the DB9. He's, I think, integral into these designs. I think he's done a nice job with Jaguar. Oh, he has. Callum told the website, forget who that was, Pistonheads is the website. Kasson told the, the website that he would be keen to redo some of his designs and work on other iconic cars to improve them. In 2014, Callum redesigned the Jaguar MK2 Sport sedan, I assume it's Mark II, uh, from the 60s as a personal project by lowering it, giving it bigger wheels, and restyling the interior. He also owns a hot rod based on a 1932 Ford Coupe. Right? Very nice. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, it definitely sounds like a car guy. So I think Jaguar will probably miss him. Hopefully his design studio there is still in good shape. 2020 Land Rover, Range Rover, Evoke looks good but lacks substance. This is Consumer Reports out of the U.S., Land Rover has redesigned its Range Rover Evoque for 2020, and we've picked one, one for testing. It has a new platform, new suspension, and new engine. That all sounds great, but in our first few weeks with the new Evoque, some doubts have popped up. Yes, it has a nice interior, some flashy new items, including retractable door handles, but it largely evokes the previous version, and we're not impressed with that one. So their impressions, first impressions, uh, what they like. Some testers found the interior attractive with excellent fit and finish, which is a good sign. There are some nice materials used, but the top dashboard surface is covered in what looks like cold black lava. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Uh, because its handling is fairly nimble, the Evoke can take corners well, but some testers noted that it's short on steering feel. In a vehicle with good uh, steering feel, drivers can determine how much grip the tires have and the surface quality of the pavement. What didn't they like? And this is a, a longer list here. The powertrain was among the sorest spots for our testers. We felt a notable and frustrating initial hesitation when starting from a stop. Then a, sur a huge burst of power as the turbo kicked in. Some felt like the SUV was lunging forward when that happened, and others noted some jerky motions when traveling at low speeds. The transmission shifts were not particularly smooth. It does have start-stop technology, so that's probably part of it. Next, the tech on the Evoke is overly fussy. Hey, there's a surprise. The SUV has dual-screen infotainment climate control setup that requires a lot of the driver's attention when making changes. It can be a distraction, as we found in the Velar. The system is also slow to load on startup and responses to touches often lag. Getting to the Evoke can be a challenge. The doors are narrow and that makes it hard to climb in or out of gracefully. We found the ride to be rather stiff and unbefitting of a Range Rover, especially in one that costs uh, more than $55,000 American. Lastly, with its thick pillars and small rear windows, which follow a discouraging industry trend, visibility is tough out of the front end. They said, well, they, they said the front and the back. Mr. McGovern would not be pleased to hear that. That was his design, right? To lower that rear end and... That's his design to go and lower the rear and make make vision going back more and more difficult slowly. 
But they did get that camera in the rear rear section, that little rear fin that's, I guess, also the radio antenna. That, to me, would be a revolution. I wonder why they didn't note that here in this article, which they did not. Maybe that's a premium package that uh, it's not included in all models. Well, it's another distraction, too, if you have to rely on a camera to do things. Yeah, yeah. And hope it works. Most of this, what I've seen about the new Evoke, I haven't actually seen one yet, is that it's incremental in design and there seems to be disappointment in that but the evoke seems to be selling fairly well so oh, it is yes what are you looking for the 2019 land rover discovery sd4 review this is a long-term review this is out of australia with which car discovery sd4 was judged four by four of the year in 2017 but what's it like to live with we had ours for six months and we don't want to give it back i'll read a good part of this here Give you a sense of it. The 2017 Discovery rode on a new aluminum monocoque chassis with full independent, height adjustable suspension, and even the design of the body was more swoopy and organic compared to the functional and boxy bodies of the Disco 3 and 4. Discovery has always had a premium feel with large, unusable interiors and grand visibility from its large greenhouse, but it also has had an excellent off-road ability thanks to long travel suspension design inherited from the Range Rover. They gave us the chance to tailor the vehicle using the online model configurator. We were able to choose everything we wanted in a disco from the options to the exterior U and interior trim colors. We wanted it to stick to the SE specification as that what gave the award to so that that limited some of the options that we were keen on. An essential option for us was the off-road package, which included height adjustable suspension, terrain response two, and the auto locking rear differential. The rest of our choices related to style, comfort, and convenience. An interesting one for us was the wheel choice. We usually always choose the smallest wheel diameter possible, but the smallest on the Discovery is a 19-inch alloy. Tire choices for 19S are very limited for the 19s, excuse me, are very limited. So we selected the optional 20-inch black alloys and there are some more off-road suitable tire options for the 20s. All up, our all-black Discovery retailed for $103,840. That's Australian, which is a fair hike from the $87,450 sticker price for the Discovery SD4 SE. Touring along the highway speeds, overtaking uh, road trains, and cutting along gravel back road detours, the Discovery felt wanting for power. Some of those long overtakes took a bit longer than you might have hoped for, but this is still a large 4x4 wagon and not a sports car. What was more amazing was fuel usage. With the holiday run sipping just 6.9 liters per 100 kilometer of diesel, in our monthly updates, the Disco is rarely broke the 10 liter per 100 kilometer mark, and that included daily commuting, highway driving, and mountain adventures. The Disco's SD4 engine might be the worst sounding engine we've ever driven, but its performance and economy make up for that. Lucky the sound system is pretty good too. After the initial highway run, we were keen to fit some tougher tires to the car for more confident off-road use. Past experience on the on the high-speed rated OE tires has us treading carefully whenever we leave the bitumen. If we wanted to test the vehicle's off-road ability with confidence, we needed better tires, so they went with factory-approved Goodyear Doratec all-terrains. With these tires, we are able to venture to the high country and out on the farm tracks without too much concern for punctures. With the suspension cranked up in height and a bit of air dropped from the tires, the sleek disco is nearly unstoppable. Uh, one of the features of the newer Terrain Response 2 is its auto mode, which adjusts the setting on, on the run depending on the terrain and the amount of wheel slip detected. It works well for general off-roading, but is a bit slow when the going gets tougher. Using your knowledge to select the right mode for the terrain beforehand ensures faster response times for the center and rear diffs, as well as the traction control. Off-road or not, the Discovery is an exceptional Grand Tour. It offers a mix of comfort, luxury, capacity, performance, and fuel economy that can't be matched by any other 4x4 wagon with general off-road, with genuine off-road ability. It's that old breath of ability thing again. It mightn't, that's their word, mightn't, might not, uh, look, for, look as functional and rugged as it is to use it, and many onlookers reckon it's downright ugly, but the Disco delivers on performance and capability. So there you go. There's your new Disco 5. Yeah, sounds very good. Yeah, it does, actually. I think people are starting to starting to like them. All right. It's time again for new Defender News. I'm not using any special effects. But at the same time, your new Defender News, your witch car 
which you just read from, had a very interesting article, more philosophical in stance, where they talked about the defender versus wrangler, the evolution versus tradition approach to things, which is a very interesting read on the approach that JLR has been taking to the evolution of the defender versus what uh, Fiat Chrysler has been doing with the Jeep. Shall I read from that? Yes. Okay. So for more than 70 years, the mission statement for two of the world's most iconic off-road vehicles, the Jeep Wrangler and the Land Rover Defender, remain largely the same. Okay. And then they go through a good bit of history on both vehicles. I'll, I'll, skip, I'll skip that part, but we'll read this. We all know that. We, yeah, we, you, at least we hope you do. And it, basically they point out their cousins, which we've certainly talked about a number of times. But here we go. I'll read uh, directly from here now, from their article now. On the one hand, you have a maker preserving with an outdated design to retain a long-standing customer. And on the other, you have a manufacturer deliberately breaking from tradition, fully aware that its decision will cost it a loyal following overnight. So who is right? Actually, they both are. And the answer comes down to numbers. Not long after the Wrangler launched in its native North America, Jeep sold nearly 28,000 in just one month, setting a new monthly sales record with a 70% increase over the sales month in March the previous year. The Wrangler is America's favorite Jeep. Need mm -hmm. that putting into stark contrast with some easy-to-understand figures? In the Defender's best year, 2012, the Land Rover sold just shy of 20,000 worldwide. That's right. In a good month, Jeep can find more homes for its Wranglers in a single country than Land Rover could find an entire year across the planet. Just to remind you, this is John saying this. It's 20,000 20, Wranglers in a month versus 20. 28,000 Wranglers in a month versus 20,000 uh, Defenders in a year. Put simply, Jeep cannot afford to lose its Wrangler customers while Land Rover can afford to keep the Defenders. <laughs> the bean counters at JLR would have looked at the Defender audience, the cash that it has the potential to haul in as a, as a hardcore utilitarian off-roader bought by farmers who replace their vehicles only when at least two wheels have fallen off, and they would have looked at the brand power of the Defender moniker. Put simply, Jeep it's, can't afford to lose Wrangler customers while Land Rover can't afford to keep them. And it comes down to a very interesting philosophical discussion because the idea of manufacture of vehicles is to make money, and that means pushing out vehicles out the door. And Jeep is doing that, and they're making scads of money doing it. Well, Land Rover, on the other hand has waited way too long, in my opinion, to, to come out with an inter with a replacement. And I'm not sure what they're looking at doing. 20,000 defenders worldwide, they produced a lot more series vehicles than that. And it begs a lot of questions on what they're doing. Don't forget, the industry advanced while Land Rover did not. And Land Rover did advance, but they did it in the Range Rover and the Discovery. The Defender series really didn't advance while the rest of the industry advanced. And in the under the underpinnings well, of the of the Wrangler of the Jeep that advanced. Not really. It's you know, it's not that much farther advanced than the Discover than the uh, Defender ever really got. Okay. You know, it's still coil sprung or right. et cetera. It's Still pretty close to what it was originally came out with. But I, also, I don't think they're the, selling tons of them. But I don't think the Jeep was ever, at least lately, and you know, probably in the last thirty years, was hand built either. No, I I, I still go back to that. It was a, you know, hand built limits you not in, in the number you can make, how often. Yeah, you could throw more people at it. But... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That was good. But, uh, yeah, no, this, this Defender versus uh, Jeep Wrangler, it's, it's, it's an interesting philosophical discussion because, and I'm not sure I'm catching the nuance, is that they're the same thing. One makes it better than the other. Handmade. Why didn't Land Rover evolve their production line? Because they're both body-on-chassis designs, hand-built. Okay, put some, compute, so put some robots in there. Well, this goes if, back. This if Jeep could do it. They could do it. You know this, and you've mentioned this before. Uh, Land Rover didn't have all the money in the world. They didn't have a big slush fund, and you had British Leyland having problems. You had Jaguar and all the other associated uh, entities when they were either with or without you know, Jaguar having financial difficulty. So it, uh, I think that's all tied together. And then they also focused on the Range Rover, and they focused on the Discovery, and they focused on the Freelander. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and this is where it goes. That's why I was saying it goes off on a philosophical tangent. But it's JLR now. It's just Jaguar. It's just Land Rover. They split Rover Group off. Yes, it's been a cash cow for everyone else, but you can only go and do these excuses so many times. And sure, they're pouring money into Range Rover and everything else. 
I understand that. They've done very well on that side. But the excuses for killing off the defender still don't wash, given what Jeep has done. In Canada, they're eating their breakfast of JLR. It just, you know, you've got something that makes a ton of cash for someone else. You own the market and you abandoned it to a competitor. You know, it doesn't matter that something is obsolete. You make all the excuses you want about, oh, the design is not as safe, it's obsolete, it's going out of style. But here's Fiat Chrysler that's making a ton of money off these things today. And manufacturing is about making money today, not about making money tomorrow, because if you don't make money today, you're not going to be there tomorrow. And yes, you're absolutely correct. And I'm putting on a maybe a past Land Rover hat here to say, well, yeah, we made a lot of money from the Freelander, from the Discovery, from the Range Rover, and we were going to get around to the to the Defender. We just never did. Other things came up, and now we have time and attention that we can give to the Defender. I hope it works for them, but I think they waited just a little too long. They they should have had they should have kept the Defender alive until the new Defender was ready to go, that- having nothing there for several years just doesn't help. That I do agree with you. I think that that should have been a more seamless cutover. But we've talked about this before, too. I think that was, oh, the, yes. that was the plan. I think that's what the DC-100 came out. And I think they had their, they were executing their plan of DC-100. We're going to do this. We're going to, we'll, we'll do the cutover in 16, 17 or something like that. And then people hated it. And they're like, well, we're still shutting this plant down, though. <laughs> we're still going <laughs> to shut it down while we retool. And then I think they come up with it came up with a different strategy of let it go away it's going to be a big too much of a change for everybody so we'll let it go away uh, keep the old production line going retool and build it in castle brome which are another plant and then go and make it and then just do a nice soft cut over oh well uh, oh, water ex- under the bridge I, exactly that's that's yeah exactly one under the bridge and uh, defenders down the road and all those kinds of things yeah it is what it is that's where we are now and Defender news, and there was much Defender news this month, and there was actually some breaking, I guess, Defender news. And you know, I'm going on vacation here in a week, and please, can we stop with the with with the re- leaked documents? And can we just wait? First thing that happens, as a personal plea on mine, uh, at the beginning of the month, uh, there the, at the Goodwood Festival of Speed, the uh, the 90 version, I think they're going to call the 90, the Defender 90, was uh, further seen, and it was actually driven by the Duke of... My apologies, Richmond, there it is, Duke of Richmond. Got to drive it. The article here says the Aston Martin DBX wasn't the only new SUV to go up the hill during the first day of the Goodwood Festival Speed as Land Rover was also there with the next-gen Defender, driven by none other, none other than the Duke of Richmond. The fully camouflaged prototype was the short wheelbase 90, expected to go on sale March 2020, following the launch of the mid-range later this year. So it just came out. It was in its camo. They drove it, or it was driven by somebody, by the Duke, and did some things. There's a picture of him. Um, there you go. Okay. Then, about a week later, uh, there was a leak of a document. I did actually do some research on this. It was leaked to the Disco4, as in the number 4.com forum. And they were able to obtain pictures of the all new Defender. And it looks like it's promotional material probably given out to, I don't think journalists. It's Although I think it could be used for a journalist. I suspect this was given to uh, dealers or accessory folks, you know, third party uh, accessory, accessory folks. This was leaked out to on this forum and, it, and the press got a hold of it. And it, it, so it made the rounds. And so we will give you the, give you the breakdown. There's going to be, I'll, I'll, I guess it's probably just better to read this from auto week. The all new defender due on sale next year will also be offered in several different styles from the start, a leaked model presentation from a company event has revealed quite a bit about the initial model lineup. For starters, the 2020 Defender will be offered in 90, 110, and 130 flavors, denoting the three different... Uh, Holly or Olive didn't like the three flavors. Holly and I... Nope. Nope, they don't. Ivy does not like the 130. She wants a, a 90. <laughs> <laughs> the middle model, the 110, will be shown in October of this year. I like that. And feature, I'm leaving that in the podcast now. And it will feature an overall length of 187.3 inches and a 118.9 inch wheelbase. The shortest model, the 90, will be will follow in March of 2020 and will measure 170.1 inches from end to end while featuring a wheelbase of 101.8 inches. The longest model will be the Defender 130, which will have the same wheelbase as the 110, but will be a bit longer overall. 
all, measuring 200.7 inches from end to end. Looks like it has a, the front overhang, based on the graphic they had, is the same in the front. The rear overhang is where they, they've added the inches on. The, mod, the 130 model won't go on sale until August of next year. To put these numbers into perspective, the longest Cadillac Escalade is 224.3 inches from end to end. The new Mercedes G-Class is 189.7 inches in length. To picture the model visually, the closest Defender to the G-Class will be the Defender 110, which will land within a couple of inches of the standard wheelbase G. The new Defenders will also be pretty tall, with the 90 model being the tallest with a height of 71.9 inches. The other two models will be just fractions of an inch lower. It's kind of interesting. The leaked materials indicate that the 90 model will have five or six seats, while the 110 will offer seating options for up to seven via third row. The 130 will offer seating for eight. When it comes to engine choices, the Defender will be offered globally with a choice of gasoline, diesel, and PHEV powertrains. Read diesel in the U.S. Two gas options will be on the menu, named P300, P400, in addition to the P a P400E PHEV powertrain with three diesels rounding out the lineup for markets other than ours. I uh, Hours so that is this auto week is that america yeah i think it is so i guess maybe we're supposed to get diesel but i'm not sure if we're getting all three versions you know these british television series yes minister had the quote of the <laughs> ship of state is the only ship that leaks from the top and i look at these leaks about the defender and it makes me realize polit politicians seem to be paragons of security compared to jlr <laughs> when it comes to Defender and the leaks about it, it's yeah. absolutely incredible. Kind of makes it does make you wonder a little bit. We'll we'll finish with this, then we'll <laughs> talk about some of those things. Yeah, exactly. Buyers of the new Defender will have five different trim levels to choose from when it comes to a new model that goes on sale. A base standard trim: S, SE, HSE, and X. Well, it comes to <laughs> Interior Tech, the 2020 Defender, thank you for that, will offer a choice of a 370-watt Meridian 10-speaker system or a 740-watt 14-speaker system, a 12-inch digital gauge cluster, an infotainment screen of undetermined size. Perhaps the biggest change, one that's overlooked a bit in these leaked slides, will be the fact that the next-gen Defender will be a luxury vehicle in a way that the outgoing Defender never was. In this regard, the next-gen model will effectively mirror the transformation of the old Mercedes G-Class from a ut utility truck into a luxury vehicle. That's what the that's what Land Rover is ultimately doing here. The new Defender will set its sights on the new G-Class. Updated just within the last two years, after more than 30 years on the line, the Defender parallel is hard to miss here, and Land Rover has made it clear that the new Defender won't be the loud and spartan machine that it has been for decades, having grown out of the series Land Rovers of decades past. This means we can expect an interior that will be on par with a current Land Rover Discovery, at, le at the very least, and with similar equipment inside, I will also say under the chassis. It remains to be seen if Land Rover will ever offer a truly Spartan version of the new model, but it seems clear that just like the G-Class, the Defender will become plusher, quieter, and more high-tech. Well, with those 14 speakers, I hope it doesn't leak with the water coming in the doors because... It's going to be a horrible sight. Better be waterproof. Better be, yeah. Inside. Like, it will be. Yeah, you know it's going to be. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite clear at this point. I think this is all good information to hear, and it kind of confirms things we've been thinking and hearing, and we've already seen. All other Land Rovers have moved upscale. It's, it's right that the new Defender would also move upscale. I think you'll see a Spartan version everywhere else. Uh, probably in Europe, maybe. Definitely, I would say Europe and in, in the UK, but I don't think you're going to see it. Um, Everywhere but North America. Everywhere, yeah. Maybe China. China might not get a Spartan one. That, that's maybe the other other big country that might not get it. Because I think Land Rover in China is also seen as a luxury market or a luxury brand. And I think that's where they position themselves there. That's true. But certainly good to hear that there's going to be three models. Mirroring what the Defender was. All going to be very interesting to see what's at the, uh, the lower end and whether or not they're actually interested at all at the utility market. I doubt it, but it'll be interesting to see what they do. Of course, you know, will that lend itself to military applications, especially in the UK, which is very possible? None of those considerations will be in the US, though. That's not going to happen. No, the evolution of military vehicles has gone down a completely different road, and I don't see that uh, Land Rover is interested in going down that road. Well, if they want to ramp up their production, it's a, and it's another way to increase your sales and capabilities, 
Jones. True. So Motor Authority also had, of course, they covered this, and I highlighted a couple things. We'll see if there's anything new in this one. A prototype of a five-door model has been spotted. There are rumors of long wheelbase model, which you already talked about, with eight seats, and the three-door version. I This one doesn't add anything new. That I'm, I'm The things I highlighted, I so all the same things, but you can get some better pictures from Motor Authority. Then there was Motor Authority had another article this time with a video, but it's the video that we've seen before of it going around to Nurburg Ring. And they also talk about the G class of being a competitor. Uh, they talk about how it's uh, sitting on the, the modular longitudinal architecture, which is that MLA chassis that they're going to be using. This is a Defender, as we just mentioned here, the Defender will be positioned as a premium offering, not unlike the G class, is led the decision to base the SUV on a new platform. Platform, the MLA, which would be shared with the next generation version of the Range Rover, Range Rover Sport and Discovery. This means fully independent suspension, front and rear, with the new rear design and clear view of the spy shots. A low range transfer case and a multiple differential locks should be present for superior performance when going off road. According to leaked info, there will be a six strong powertrain lineup consisting of three gasoline and three diesels. The most potent powertrains are found in the P400 and P400E grades. The P400 features a three liter turbocharged inline six, while the 400E features a plug-in hybrid setup pairing a two liter turbocharged inline four with an electric motor. In both cases, you're looking at more than 400 horsepower and 400 pound feet of torque. All these articles are suggesting that the prices will be between a 53 thousand dollar discovery and a sixty seven thousand dollar Range Rover Sport. I have to think that's though for the that's gotta be for the upper range of the new defender. I would think that the S and S E are gonna be I think sub sub less than that. It's gonna be very interesting to see where they price these things and where they think that their volumes are going to be found. Yeah, well definitely I think in the US you're gonna find it in the in the a, uh, probably the SE, the HSE, and then this new X model trying to get a better view of this uh document that they have they break down the different models so there's the at the top there's x hse se s and then standard so that is five trim levels for example on the vision the lighting the top the bottom standard probably best way to work up that just gets led lights and uh, rear fog the s then gets a front fog lamps the se is premium led with signature drl an auto high beam assist. Resolution here is difficult to read all this. HSE then is matrix LED, auto high beam assist, and the X is darkened taillights. And then the, on the wheels, the X has dark finish. So it looks like maybe the, the X is a, I wonder if the X is gonna be like the, is that gonna be the, the first year? What do they call that? The introductory model? What are they, there's a term they use for that. Oh, yes. The introduction, the introductory model, you know, the first one. Land Rover's mm -hmm. been doing this now for the last couple models. I was hoping you'd come up with a term so I could edit out the podcast and just leave that in. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dixon. Thanks. <laughs> So they give you information here on powered convenience and seating. So uh, it looks like the electrical assist, all the different assist things are out there. There's a, at the, at the X level for the assist is co-pilot pack. Actually, so they call these ADAs. I assume that's like assisted driver aids maybe. I can't read all of the ones for the base level. It's tough to tell. The SE level has a uh, park pack. The HSE has drive pack and park pack. And then the X level is co-pilot pack. So that'd be kind of interesting. Wonder that. I wonder if that's more of a autonomous driving. Okay, We're going to be going down that road. I'm just not sure yeah. where they are on that. Not many leaks on that yet. And there's more engine detail. So if you want to see that, that's all out there. They're supposed to reveal the new Defender at the Frankfurt, right? Is that the Frankfurt Motor Show on the 12th of September? So I suspect there might be another odd leak or two before then. To take it back to that point, Dixon, I, you, you makes you wonder. This information came out and got leaked to this Disco 4 forum. Looked at the gentleman's name here if i remember correctly it was from yeah helsinki so it claims at least that's the forum member have been on the forum for almost two years and they they claim their location is uh, helsinki and i guess they appear to drive a disco three who are they did land rover go after them and of course clearly it hasn't been taken down which is kind of interesting because you think they would have gone after them because you know there's non-disclosure agreements and embargoes like journalists get that if they get information, they can't talk about it. So it makes you wonder where this came from. Again, ship estate, 
leaks from the top. <laughs> so are you saying that they did this on purpose? Well, when you want to keep things secret and then you look at the leaks everywhere, you can only come to so many conclusions. <laughs> There's a limited set of conclusions. Because they managed, especially from from the demise of the Defender up until recently, all the plans of where they were going with the Defender de- new Defender development, it was actually kept very tight lipped. You know, there was just no news coming out. And then now it's just, it's like the dam broke. Or if they had a dam, it's now a weir. <laughs> <laughs> and everything's just pouring over. You mean it's like a an, an old Defender bulkhead? That's right. Like the door <laughs> seals in a series vehicle. <laughs> There you go. That's uh, new Defender news. And next up, this is a this is not a Land Rover story, but it to me is close to being one because it's a, it's going to be a new competitor. The Bollinger has some awesome mods planned for its upcoming electric truck, and this is from Jalopnik. And the article says, while I know we're getting all the new Land Rover Defender soon, I can't help but feel like the upcoming all electric Bollinger B1 and B2 SUV and truck are the real spiritual successor to the original Defender, and these new available modifications are only more convincing. While the new actual Defender seems to share a lot with the regular, very posh, modern Land Rovers of the world, like targeting more likely targeting more of the new luxury uh, Mercedes G-Class market than the rugged utilitarian off-roading market, this electric Bollinger checks all the boxes. Simple, boxy, off-road capable, and more importantly, extremely modifiable as the company recently revealed. That includes tube frame doors, basket style roof railing, a roof ladder, enough roof mounted lights to peer through a black hole, both a rear mounted spare and a hood mounted spare for when that 200 mile or less off road adventure goes really, really wrong. Headlight grills, fender flares, black wheels, a truck winch, and two jerry cans full of, I would assume, water. Uh, Both the SUV and the truck come with two electric motors, one per axle, making it all wheel drive with a total output of 614 horsepower, 668 pound feet of torque. Top speed is 100 miles per hour and the 120 kilowatt battery packs offer a claimed 200 mile range pushing around a curb weight of 4,800 pounds while bollinger was initially supposed to begin deliveries months ago the company now claims deliveries of the five-door model will begin in 2020 it is an impressive looking truck it will be very interesting to see this thing out in the wild. Well, you've seen the video of them taking it off-road, right? Yeah. That was damned impressive, I have to say. I do agree with some of the thinking that it is a, it's more like you think maybe a a, a new Defender or, or a evolutionary Defender might have been like, you know, it has that kind of feel to it if Land Rover wasn't moving everything upscale. It makes you wonder why Land Rover couldn't go and put a boxy body and so on that looks like the, the old Defender on their new platform, but They've decided to go a different direction, but this the Bollinger looks uh, fantastic in terms of the ability to, to add and subtract things, and it just looks quite impressive. Oh, it absolutely does, and it has a nice stance. It's got that, as you said, boxiness. It's got a lot of glass. I would say that the the access to the roof for that ladder is on the side of the truck. I don't think that's the best placement for that, especially if you're going down a trail and you don't want it to, to get caught on a tree or something. But aside from that, it looks the part. It looks something that utility companies and a lot of people that want something functional will certainly be very interested in. I'm still waiting for the day when they get solar panels to the point that you could put solar panels on top of the vehicle and then you could do legit charging and almost have unlimited range on a bright sunny day. Uh, They have to get the efficiency of solar panels to go up a long way. That day is coming. At least I would think it would be. And with a flat roof that the Bollinger has, that'd be perfect. You could slap them right right on the roof and you'd probably just drive for days. And especially if you're going off-roading where you're not even near any fuel. Yep. Tim Slesser really could take gin and tonic in the containers. Yeah. (laughs) In the cherry cans. (laughs) So that's the Bollinger coming out, I guess, next year. I do think that'll be competing for the for the new Defender, right? They, although they should probably have jumped on the bandwagon here a little sooner. Next up, it's been 30 years for the Land Rover Discovery. So happy birthday to the Disco. This article is from Auto Car. It's like a review of the Disco 1 when it first came out. Developing new cars on the kind of budget that a German company would spend on a new dashboard has long been a specialty of the British motor industry. One of the more famous is the Land Rover Discovery, which began life in 1989 as a recloth, cost-reduced Range Rover designed to sit between the aging Defender and a Range Rover enjoying even more success as it was pushed up market. You didn't need to look underneath the Discovery to see the similarities with the Range Rover. It shared the same windscreen and distinctively slim A-pillars, the same front door glass, and much of its inner structure. 
But to avoid producing a vehicle of almost identical silhouette, the Discovery's designers added a stepped roof, the raised rear section carrying slender lengths of glazing angled towards the sky. I think we call those Alpine windows, right? They just carried. That's right. Well, they I guess they carried it over from the from the series trucks, right? They did series one. This was the work of Conran Design, which was asked to develop an interior suitable for a vehicle as a lifestyle accessory. <laughs> I just, sorry, I just kind of hung on that one for a second. Life, the whole vehicle is a lifestyle accessory. Is that what they're saying? Yes. <laughs> Slender storage racks were mounted above the windscreen. Stretchable overhead nets provided carriers for pith helmets and water bottles. Can, do we have to say pith? helmets does that seems i don't think the british wear pith helmets anymore and a massive panic handle confronted the front seat passenger even before you turn the key it felt like you were having an adventure most buyers chose the diesel it's modest 100 11 brake horsepower was buttressed by a more promising 195 pound of torque, all of this appearing at a helpfully low 1800 RPM. But once you get over the mild shock of hearing what sounds like a truck engine settling Land Rover's very first production discovery all a quiver, it's this stout pulling power that draws you along in a pleasingly languid style. You have to work at it, the 200 TDI torque's peak being more pointy than flat, but once momentum is gathered, the Discovery bowls and rolls along with comfortable authority. The original Discovery was quite a vehicle. It sold well. It fit the mar- fit the uh, the market right between the Range Rover and the Defender very well. Its evolution, however, is a whole different discussion. And they, they finish up here with such impressions are as keenly felt in the rear, the sheer height of the rear compartment, the surface area of glass, and the comfortable, commodious rear bench make this great machine for the long distance that it conjures in your mind eye. Uh, this was a cost-compromised car. Any 1980s Rover nerd is able to expose the origins of its door handles, instruments, switch gear, and taillights. Maestro van uh, for the last, if you must know. But it was one capable of taking its buyers and makers towards exceedingly fresh terrain. Which is interesting considering that the article goes and talks about the Alpine windows, the space in the back and such, this stepped roof, all of which has been lost on the latest discovery. The roof goes down lower. It's hard to see out of the back of it. There's no Alpine windows anymore. It's been quite an evolution. There's a stepped roof. They they call it out in the marketing material. It's like three millimeters. Well, if <laughs> if any listener is on Instagram, if they go to Retro 80, they recently have produced a T-shirt with the Disco 1, 2, I think 3 and three. 5 on it. And you can see the silhouettes of all of these vehicles. And it's a remarkable evolution over the past 30 years. Yeah, it, it is actually a, a nice design. I did I saw that. It's nice how they kind of lined up. I'll assume they're all in the same scale. Is that would that be? Is you think that's an accurate depiction of that? I think they look to be yes. Yeah, because it looks like the wheelbase hasn't has changed a little bit. Well, the wheelbase of Disco One, Disco Two was the same, and then three, four, and five seem to all be the same, with it being a wider wheelbase, and the overhangs all look the same proportion. If you go uh, look at uh, look at the range, that's right. It's an interesting article. Yeah, it is. It's been thirty years, so happy birthday to the Discovery. Forced the defender to get its name yes and i would say there's more disco ones on the road than i've seen of disco twos it was a well done vehicle uh you think so we're i mean certainly in the in the u.s there seems to be a lot of disco twos but it seems to be the preferred model but may, maybe that's just because they they lost their value more quickly and they're sort of cheap <laughs> well the disco one was more of a part spin vehicle the maestro door handles or tr7 door handles and a lot of things were found in other vehicles which made a lot of common parts. If you have a wheel bearing going, it's a GM wheel bearing. If you need parts and so on for a Disco 2, it's a much more unique vehicle and harder to keep maintain and keep going. Right, that's a good point. I guess there was a, a greater amount of parts, not just, but they weren't simply Land Rover parts. They were other manufacturers. Yeah, Rover Group at the time. As we think about the new Defender and we think about the, the current styling of uh, Land Rover and the current way they're, they're made, it's good to see this and keep in mind that when the trucks were built back in 30 years ago, they, were, they weren't using strictly Land Rover parts. They were using from the parts bin and pulling in latches from other that were used by by other makes and so they they weren't necessarily on their own and now we're seeing land rover on its own that is very true uh no segue here but speaking of series trucks 
The Dalai Lama's Land Rover Series 2 is up for sale. And this is a, see, a 1966 Series 2A is up for sale at the Sotheby's auction, I believe here in the U.S., to be held around Labor Day. This particular one, why is it special? It's a 19, as I said, 66 uh, Series 2A. It is believed, well, that, well, I think not believed, they have the fact uh, that it did transport the 14th Dalai Lama. According to a published report, uh, this Land Rover was never actually driven by the Dalai Lama. He would have ridden shotgun uh, on his many travels across India, Nepal, and mainly on the Himalayas. So not only is it the Dalai Lama's conveyance, but it was actually in the Himalayas and Nepal, which I think is just cool, cool in and of itself. It's a striking looking vehicle. It's been well restored. No one knows what happened to the vehicle after 1976 because he had the vehicle for 10 years or it was, it was in 2005 that this vehicle was identified when it was brought for restoration to the West Coast British uh, Land Rover specialists. At that point, the vehicle had 70,000 miles on the odometer. The Land Rover was restored top to bottom, received a complete rebuild of the original engine along with an original paint job. In 2007, it went up for auction on eBay and was sold for $82,000. I'll assume that's American. And then they're looking now, they've priced this uh, Series 2A to be between $100,000 and $150,000. As much as the Defender 110, that's pretty good for a series. It is a striking uh, looking vehicle. Yeah. They, they did a really nice job, at least in the, the, there's one picture and it looks like they did a really nice job with it. Uh, it's all green except for the Safari roof, which is uh, alabaster or maybe it's actually white. Oh, those wheels black or is that? They are, no, I think those wheels are green. That's tough to tell. They, they're either green or black when definitely the tires are black, but I think the wheels are just... They look to be uh, body colored. Yeah, the so. roof and uh, sun sheet are correct. Oh, it should be limestone. I could be just the color of the photos. Yeah. And can't speak to the green wheels. The, n the number plate is H... It looks like H-I-M or is it H-1-M-7-5-5-5? I, I, is that for Himalaya? Is that what you think that might be? I don't know. It doesn't look like it looks like a British plate as opposed to an Indian or Nepalese plate. So if you're interested <laughs> in, in a storied special Series 2A, now's your chance and your opportunity around Labor Day here, which is like, what, September 5th, I think, this year in the U.S. Well, that's Land mm -hmm. Rover news for the month. One final story that we want to talk about, and this is more general about the U.S. car market. Dixon and I find it very fascinating, so we wanted to talk about it, spend a few minutes about this. And this is the average age of vehicles in the in the U.S. This is strictly the U.S. And this uh, the title of the article is Average Age of Vehicles Sets Record. New vehicle sales dropped to where they were 20 years ago. So the average age of passenger cars and trucks on the road in the U.S. ticked up again in 2019 set to set a, another record of 11.8 years. The gentleman that wrote this article says, When I entered the car business in 1985, the average age had just ticked up to 7.8 years, and the industry was fretting over it and thought the trend would have to reverse and customers would soon come out of hiding and massively replace those old clunkers with new vehicles, and everyone would sell more and make more. But those industry hopes for a sustained reversal of the trend of the rising age of the rising average age has been bitterly disappointed. The rising average age is largely driven by vehicles lasting longer, an unintended consequence of relentless improvements in overall quality forced upon automakers by finicky customers in an uncompetitive market while automakers struggle to stay alive. In 1999, new vehicle sales reached a record 16.9 million units. This record was broken in 2000 with 17.3 million units. Sales tapered off in 2007. They dropped to 16.1 million. The 08 financial crisis hit. Uh, GM and Chrysler uh, went bankrupt. Ford almost did. Uh, sales plunged 40% to 10.4 million units by 2009. The, re the recovery has been steep. And in 2015, the old record in 2000 was broken, but barely with 17.48 million units sold. In 2016, the industry eked out another record of 17.55 million units, and that was it. Sales have fizzled since then. So far in 2019, the data indicates that sales are likely to fall below 17 million units, according to this gentleman's estimates, the author's estimates, bringing the industry right back to where it had been 20 years ago in 2019. So it's not that Americans as a whole have fewer cars, far from it. They have more cars, and those cars are on average older. The number of vehicles in operation in 2019 rose by 5.9 million units from 2018 to a new record of 278.3 million vehicles. 
<laughs> and for some perspective, the the last census said there were there, there were 330 million Americans. In other words, during the 12 month period, about 17 million new vehicles were added to the national fleet, and 11 million units were removed, either by being sent to the salvage yard or by being exported to other countries. Uh, damn those finicky consumers that want vehicles that last longer. That part of it, I didn't understand. It seems like they were uh, attacking the uh, the consumers who were just demanding what they were promised, which was a car that didn't last more than a few years, and, and they didn't have to put a lot of money into it by having it constantly being repaired. Maybe the industry in North America is following Land, Land Rover's lead, considering Land Rover claims that 70% of all Land Rovers are still in existence. <laughs> Mine is 68 years old. That average has to, is going to continue to rise a little bit. Someone needs to do a little actual fact-checking on that. I'm not sure how one goes about that, but uh, it, it does make you wonder. They, they've thrown that out for, I've heard that for probably 10 years, that 70% of all Land Rovers ever made are still on the road or still available, something like that. And then also what X percent of the world's population, the first vehicle they ever saw was a Land Rover. Well, that were, that probably was true at one point in time. The 70 percent number, um, the Land Rover lost a, a case with the British uh, advertising board or whatever it was to that they had to stop doing that because there was no numerical proof or wow. anything that could substantiate that. Gotcha. There you go. Good. But it is a good statistics to throw, throw well, around. It is. It sounds cool. It really does. But you you wonder when you start looking into it and questioning it. I'm sure Disco's two, Disco 2s have probably dropped that average down. <laughs> <laughs> no, Freelanders. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey. Hey, don't, don't be dissing the mighty Freelander. Considering that some preliminary looks at how many Series 1s that were imported into North America survived. It's looking like somewhere at this point in time, at least 20% have, which is pretty good. Yeah, a good number. You, yeah, it makes you kind of, how many uh, Chevy Cobalts are still on the road? <laughs> how many Jeeps are still on the road? A lot. Yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. Of course, to me, they all look alike. I have never developed the eye for differentiating between Jeeps. Well, this article goes on to say, so the rising average age doesn't mean that Americans drive the same vehicle for a longer period of time, though they can and many do, but that there is a strong market and demand for good older vehicles and people buy them and drive them for a few more years. But it is an issue for automakers. They could sell a lot more vehicles, and I mean a whole bunch more, if their vehicles on average reach the end of their life after eight years. But our finicky customers, there's a finicky customer again, don't go for this program anymore. Quality is one of the factors that decides whether an automaker is going to make it or whether it will die. What's left for automakers to do to increase revenue in this environment of two decades of stagnating unit sales? A three-pronged industry strategy has emerged. Shift customers to more expensive vehicles, such as from cars to trucks and SUVs. Load the vehicles with more goodies each year, such as driving assist features and jack up the prices pure and simple. And automakers have been doing it across the board, which has, which has the effect that for many Americans, new vehicles have become too expensive and they stop buying them, which puts further downward pressure on unit sales. But Wall Street, which keeps pushing automakers to go further and further upscale, because that's where the money is, hasn't figured this out yet. Well, given that the warranties of vehicles are getting longer and longer and longer, some of them are up to 10 years now. One uh, old magazine that I have, which is interesting, not so much as it was the one that discusses the introduction of the, the GM V8, which became the Rover V8, but in the same issue, the editorial is bemoaning the fact that one of the automakers had extended the warranty on a new car from 30 days to 90 days, and that this might be the thin edge of the wedge that brings the industry down. <laughs> now you look at the mileage that comes with a warranty on a car, a number of years, and the for corrosion and everything else. And of course, they're getting driven higher and higher because they're being made so much better. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. I mean, the, the, there's been pressure to make a better car and to have it more be more reliable and last longer, and it's definitely happened. To me, it's inevitable, and that's what customers wanted. They would did want a car that lasted longer. Of course, the problem with that is that drives the price up because more that goes into it to making a, a good car and to making a reliable car. So there is there is that trade off. What where where's that level? I think part of the problem is, especially in America, they're not making good cheap cars because there's not a lot of profit mar uh, margin in it. So unfortunately, that's why you, I think think you see Ford getting out of the car. Uh, out of the car business sounds like G gm's going to be getting out of the car business and making a limited number of actual sedans and coupes and they're just going to make trucks suvs 
And the pressure is going to get even worse in sense of the longevity of these vehicles because electric vehicles do not have the wear and tear that an internal combustion engine has. That's these good things are, you know, the, the average age of a vehicle is going to continue to rise and the, the car manufacturers are going to have to figure out how to live with this and how to do it. So electric cars especially have less consumables. I mean, they have what? There's no oil. There's no, there's minimal lubrication. I don't think there's anything that needs to be re-lubricated. Probably windshield washer fluid just may be the only thing that's the, that's a consumable in an electric car. That's one of the reasons that General Motors EV back in what was that the nineties? I think it came and went. That's one of the things I talked about. There's you know, one, no consumables. <laughs> yeah. You're talking about it. bearings and other things that don't go very often. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a, a real game changer for everything from the manufacturers to their uh, maintenance and upkeep. This article also shows, especially towards the end, talking about moving everything upscale, that shows, I think, probably reinforces what Land Rover has been doing, which is as the American market has been going upscale, Land Rover's chasing that and following that. There's where the money is, and I think that's where their niche is, especially as a small manufacturer of automobiles. That, you know, that's that's where they best fit in. That's right. And, and where, why they've gone that way. And I think why the new Defender will be good, clearly, especially in the U.S., will be going that way because that's where the money is. That's what people want, and they want the tech. They want the reliability, even though some of us uh, folks may not worry about reliability as much. The the average driver uh, and purchaser of an automobile, I think, wants a reliable vehicle. That's right, and as long as all these terrain controls and everything else lasts out the the warranty period, which is approaching a decade now, people will be happy. Especially with it being a computer-controlled feature, unless the physical part of the sensor goes bad or the control servo, whatever that might be, goes bad. You know, you can update the car code and make it a better impact on the customer and their experience because then you can keep the car a little more fresh. The only limiting factor is going to be current regulation that requires the manufacturers to have all of these parts, computers and so on, available for 10 years from the data manufacturer. At that point in time, well, we'll see what, what happens with regulations. If it changes and goes up or these things fall off the road because computers die. Well, the thing about that is that you can replace the computer part relatively easily with something more modern. It's the code. Has to integrate in. Recall one of the news stories from a previous uh, center steer with the different computers in the, what was it, a, a land a Range Rover that talked about they were they got into an argument with each other over what the uh, proper odometer reading was and right. then picked a number that was way too high. That's yeah, good point. Good point. The longevity of vehicles continues to rise. They're catching up with the series vehicles. It's very good. <laughs> Interesting article, certainly. Do you think uh, Canada is similar? Maybe Europe is probably similar. I don't think Australia is probably all similar. I would say Japan. Uh, similar I would in say it, it'd be interesting to take a look at because the United States has its dry climates, which is going to increase the age of vehicles. Canada, Eastern Canada and the northeast of the United States with the salt and so on is going to drop that number dramatically. I would expect Australia probably has a higher average age because of the climate. Europe would be probably similar to North America. So what's the average age of your fleet, dear listener? And I I assume that you probably have a Land Rover, maybe two or three, and you probably have a non-Land Rover that's your daily driver. That's always my vision and and my impression of most Land Rover owners is they have a non-Land Rover as a daily, and then they have a two or three Land Rovers, and at least one is working, right? That's right. At least that's me. I've got, you know, Volkswagen Jetta, and then I've got two Rovers, and then and I think you have, you're you similar, right? You have a, an Audi, I think, is your daily. And Q5 to tow the 80-inch uh, around, and a few more uh, Series 1s kicking around. That's the news for July 2019. Next up is our interview with Dan Warden of the One Ton Land Rover Club. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic cars and trucks from Europe and South America. They're a registered Virginia dealership with a physical showroom just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. They specialize in importing and restoring different makes, models, and variants of vehicles not originally sold in the United States. Their vehicles are imported, titled, and available for you to test drive before you buy. For the Land Rover enthusiast looking for two-door Range Rover Classics, TDI-powered Discoveries, or beautifully restored Defenders, their showroom in Marshall, Virginia is a unique destination. Looking for something special? They can help source, restore, and import that special truck you've been looking for. Contact Commonwealth Classics for your next classic vehicle. Commonwealth Classics. Visit www.cwclassics.com.
And now on this Understeer podcast all the way from the United Kingdom is Dan Warden. Welcome, Dan, to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Dan, you run the One Ton Land Rovers website, which is uh, onetonlandrovers.co.uk, all spelled out. We'll have that in the show notes, of course. And wanted to, I've been wanting to have you on the show for a long time, so thanks for finally coming on and explaining what a One Ton Land Rover is. Let's start there. What is a One Ton Land Rover? Uh, right, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> that's a, sounds a simple question doesn't it <laughs> well you have a whole website dedicated to it <laughs> exactly and even i sometimes think well is that one is that not one i mean in a nutshell i suppose it stems from in in a brief sort of history lesson you've got obviously the six cylinder land rovers which made their way to the states as well land rover basically offered a, an uprated version of the six-cylinder long wheelbase utility where they kind of hybridized a regular Land Rover with a forward control. You'd kind of, if you imagine a 2B forward control with a bit of 2A forward control and then with a standard body on, you kind of get into where the one tonner is. So the range at the time you had the short wheelbase half ton, long wheelbase three quarter ton. This is off road payloads. The forward control was then a two um, was one and a quarter tons. So there was a bit of a gap. So they bought this this one ton Land Rover. So they've they've got a long wheelbase Land Rover, which they fitted heavy duty axles, bigger wheels and tires, uprated suspension, various other bits and bobs on it. And it's filling this gap in the range between the three-quarter ton standard long wheelbase and the one and a quarter ton forward control. Plus, it's offering, um, in theory at least, you know, it was a platform for building your fire tenders, your access platforms, or your specialist conversions that were a bit too heavy for the standard Land Rover but that didn't warrant the use of the forward control um, as a basis. So that's kind of kind of roughly what the uh, what the idea of the model was at least so hopefully that gives you some indication of where i'm coming from now was that it was that its own model or was that just a special order configuration that again is is uh, <laughs> kind of, again it's a simple question but in, well hence my asking it i'm a little confused myself i mean in effect you both aspects are correct There was a specific model, which was the one ton, which had its own chassis number sequences and its own build specifications. So on a two-way ENV axles, a six-cylinder engine, 2B type gearbox, standard body. So so you could walk into a dealer and say, give me a one ton? Yes. Okay. The problem is that what that dealer could do was was kind of one of two things. They could either go, I want a one ton, so you would get this. So this vehicle would come, which would be a six-cylinder engine, 916 tires, etc. The the whole shebang. Right. They could order that. They could um, certainly a lot later on in the late series three era. You could kind of order it piecemeal. So you could say, well, I want a vehicle with a one-ton or an uprated payload. So it would probably have the suspension that wouldn't necessarily have all of the other parts. You've then got odd vehicles like um, the Takar 1 fire tenders, which are kind of one tons, but kind of aren't, because they were forcing in the petrols, and, and the two A's were on their own build sequence. The Series 3s were then built to the same spec, but used standard chassis numbers. The Norwegian Army had, I think it was 600 and something 109s in the 70s that had the wheels and tires, the gearbox, etc. But again, they were just on standard four-cylinder export chassis numbers. So the numbers kind of, um, how can I put it? It's like if you've got a vehicle on a one-ton chassis number, it's definitely a one-ton. But there okay. are vehicles out there that are effectively one-tons. But if you read the numbering, they aren't. So basically, Land Rover was building their own tributes. Um, I suppose you could look at it that way. There, there were certainly there were oddities with the numbering. I mean, we, I suppose, when you get you know very rivet counter on it, and you're looking at number sequences and that kind of thing, that didn't matter so much to Land Rover as it does to does to us now. Sure. Um, and you got things. I mean, one good example in there on my website, uh, the vehicles that went to Portugal, the factory built vehicles that went to Portugal 
were on the 223 prefix uh, left hand drive six cylinder one ton as you would expect mm-hmm. there were identical vehicles sent over as ckd kits but they were on left hand drive ckd six cylinder utility chassis numbers not one ton numbers Okay. So if you run C number through any of the sequences, you'd be, oh, well, that's a three-quarter tonner. But they weren't. They were physically one tons. Yeah. And even all these other oddities, like shawl and armoured cars. Take the body off a shawl and armoured car, you've got a one tonner underneath. But they were never, recur- re- never referred to as that. The numbers don't tally up. So, <laughs> you know. But, I mean, for me, it was basically a case of I, I bought one, and no one knew anything about them other than that they existed. So the whole website was me basically trying to work out where these things came from, what the specs were, and try and find if there were any others out there. Because, you know, I mean, they are a very rare model. There weren't very many built, so... uh, And even fewer have survived, obviously. Your website is quite extensive. I would spend some time looking through it. It's a (laughs) nice job of giving, you know, a lot of detail. So, yeah, if you like the detail that you're you're hearing, the website would be good for that. I guess, are there a couple specific things that identify a 110 immediately? Like, is there a is there a manufacturing range? Are there any visual cues that you could tell that yes, that's a 110, or is it something where you you have to climb underneath and look around? And sounds like VIN numbers even aren't aren't a hard and fast rule either, though. But I guess are there some hard rules that that define a 110? If you if you're looking at a at a factory built vehicle. And and in terms of the general what a one ton is, you're going to be looking for a six cylinder engine, which you can tell from outside by the exhaust. And you're going to be looking for the extended spring mounts. Generally speaking, if you've got those, you've probably got a one ton, at least in a UK specification uh, situation. If you've got Uh, the combination of the six cylinder and the long shackles. However, uh, if you've got a four cylinder long shackles, you might have a one ton or you might have a military truck. Yeah, I mean, ninety nine percent of the time you've got a military truck. You've, you've got an, you know, British Army, which were three quarter ton rated. But then you've got oddities like the Australian Army had six cylinders with the extended spring mounts, mm-hmm. and I think they even used the same springs and dampers as a one ton. But they weren't one ton. They weren't. They weren't rated as one tonners. They were never referred to as a one tonner. So generally. Yeah, I'm going to be looking for, in, in a UK or Europe context, so indeed probably in Africa as well, the six-cylinder, the long spring mounts, and generally the 916 tyres and the, and the deep wheel rims as well. And typically uh, they had the wide brake shoes up front too, didn't they? Yeah, well, all the six-cylinders did, yeah. Um, there's a bit of a question whether the whether the four-cylinder versions did. I, I think they did as well. But okay. I, I'd neglect to be sure. That's not a hard and fast rule either, then, is what you're saying. It's saying I haven't looked into it in, okay. in detail to give you a definitive okay. answer. But I All do right. know the lads, with, for example, with Norwegian uh, 109s, I, I, I'm sure they, I think they have got three three inch shoes, but I, I'd have to go back to them and check. I'd have to ask the question. Gotcha. So, Dan, is it safe yeah. is safe to say then that the the one tons almost like the early S, S uh, you know, special vehicles unit Land Rover where they were making special purpose Land Rovers? Is that because it's when I looked at a website, you know, there's fire tenders, there's uh, uh, everything, but like I guess military applications. Well, the the thing is with hmm, I'm I'm that's that's quite an interesting question actually i mean they they weren't built by special vehicles if that's what you mean but it's certainly true that a lot of them did end up with special conversions well i think the special vehicles like to use it because it was good but i think also if i remember correctly my history i think the one ton was developed by special vehicles it, it may have been or, or, or certainly it was certainly developed with that in mind was, okay. spe- um, was special vehicles of, early on in the Land Rover world? I thought that was more of a, a late, later thing. That's been well, around. SVO is recent, but special vehicles has been around since, well, uh, I'm familiar with them in the 60s, but I think they predated that. Uh, okay. All right. They, they certainly goes back to at least to the 60s. I, I, I'm not a Series 1 man, so I, I don't know to what extent they were around then, but certainly in the 60s they were around. Um, and I, I, I definitely get the impression that there was, as technology had progressed and you'd, you'd got 
Land Rovers with you know fire bodies, ambulances, and things like that. They were basically maxing out the the, the gross weight of the vehicle. So you were having, I think there were issues with people were ordering a standard Land Rover, standard 109, um, fitting it out as a as a fire engine or an access platform or whatever it was, and then finding they had no payload left because the conversion itself was was so heavy. So the one tonner allowed, they could carry out the same conversion and then they would still have that little bit extra, you know, for carrying some equipment and that kind of thing. So I think that was definitely part of the thought behind the the, the product. So I, I think in, in the planning stage, yeah. So how does it relate to then the military applications? It seems to me that they would have been similar, but maybe not. Well, parts uh, of them are the same, but but yeah, there are a lot of differences too. Obviously, I mean the the, the suspension mounts at least were inherited from the military vehicles. Uh, I think possibly the rear springs as well. But basically, what seems to have happened is that when the one ton was launched, um, the army in Britain uh, had standardised on the four cylinder engine. Uh, they didn't want the six cylinder, and there's I don't really think they used them. Certainly not in any anything approaching quantity. So they were just kind of bypassed. But um, some African countries did have, I think Nigeria had quite a lot of one tons for their army. If I remember right, the Greek Air Force had two as well. So they did have some military use. But yeah, I think the the rank and file military trucks used some of the suspension bits, but Mm -hmm. still had the skinny brakes and the standard engine. Yeah, that seems to be the case. They they had the standard uh, ratio gearbox as well. And, and obviously they were running 750-16 tyres. Uh, you know, they, they didn't run the 916s, even though they could. You know, they had the ex, they had the the, ex, the deeper mounts that would have allowed them to be fitted, but they they never ran them with them fitted. Based on your website, it looks the uh, one tons ran from 68 to 77. Why yeah. did uh, why did they stop? What uh, why was there not one you know, moving into? I guess that would be what series three territory. It's late series three, yeah. It it just seems. I think at that time they were they were kind of getting the range in such a way as you know they were looking at what was selling well and what wasn't. The one ton was selling, you know, no more than a couple of hundred a year, um, and it, it it was probably just considered you know, just not profitable, just not worth considering it. You know, they, they were streamlining the the product line. So, and, so in other words, British Leyland. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did see one yeah, reference they, they, on your website about the. Looks like they were trying to sell them in Asia as a pickup. Is that the case, mm, or am I confusing that with something that else? The, is that the one two nine? Do you mean the Do you mean the oil field wagon? Maybe that was it. I, I used to said I went through the website and I didn't take that note down, but I remember uh, yeah. reading something about it. Yeah, the first vehicle that they ever referred to as a one tonner was the big one two nine pickup Middle East, but it, they only ever built I think six of them, two of which still survived. But it, it, it didn't have any real sort of okay. direct impact on on the gotcha. what eventually became the production one ton. Right. So how many how many one tons were produced? Well, obviously, I, d- I don't know how many CKDs were made because the records never survived. In terms of production, factory-built vehicles, uh, the total, I think, was about 475. Oh, okay. Which makes them rarer than a Tickford Series 1 station wagon. <laughs> Plus all the ones that were special ordered and configured by the dealer to be to be one tons, but they weren't. E- yeah. So add in, a, 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 I don't know, a couple of hundred more. Yeah, pick a number. Yeah, if you're going to include things like the Shawlands and... The odd, I mean, they'd have been very rare. I don't, you know, I don't think there were very many vehicles specified that way. Yeah, pre, you know, a few hundred more maybe, but I, I doubt it'd be more than that, a couple of hundred. And how many survive? Oh, uh, seems like a handful. Let, oh, 50 or 60. Yeah. I've actually just realized 475 was a series threes. So I think it was about 700 if you include the two is. Well, there's but at I least one in Canada. Is there? No, I didn't know of that. Yeah, there's a one ton in Nova Scotia. Oh, Uh-oh. you'll have to send me the details on that one. Breaking news. <laughs> now, 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 Dan, do you maintain a registry of all the known one one tons? Yeah, well, uh, th- there is on on the site is sort of little individual pages for the known surviving vehicles. There are 
a few others that are out there, but I, I don't have a great, uh, yeah, well, basically I might have a photograph, a number plate, you know, it's one that it's just known to exist, but I haven't really got any info on it. So there's um, a page on there of like uh, suspects and, you know, vehicles. We seem to be one tons, but we don't, don't really have any info on them. So if any of our listeners know of any one tons out there, they should certainly send that info to you so you can update your records. Yes, please. And you also have a forum on the website, I assume, is for discussion of 110 and 110 related items. And, and yeah. one tons as well. Did I say 110? Yeah. Sorry, my apologies. It's, I have 110 <laughs> on the mind. Uh, <laughs> it's a one, a one ton forum. Yeah, well, it, it was actually, it actually covers forward controls and, and a few other sort of bits as well. It's It's pretty quiet, as you can imagine, but it was kind of useful to have one area where all this sort of information could be collated and to let you know allow people to sort of exchange ideas and for those of us who own them to keep in touch because as you'd appreciate parts are rare and information's rare so it's useful to kind of be in touch but a lot of people these days it's all facebook and and that kind of thing so you know, forums of uh, a little bit quieter than I remember from years ago. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Now the the forward uh, the one tons are not are not forward control, but the forward controls are one ton. Is that what I'm getting from this? Yeah the the one oh one forward control is a, a one tonny as we would say because it's a, okay. It's a met- ton. metric ton. Um, yeah. yeah. Whereas the the one ton is an imperial ton. Okay. Uh, which was, which is, it is, is a standard um, bodywork, yeah, with the cab in the middle, if you if you want to call it that, yeah. That's the one that's built on the extra subframe that sits on top of the stock chassis, right? The 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 two A and two B four controls are, yeah. Right, yeah, and th- those are a one oh nine, right? Those uh, the two A was a one oh nine. The the two B was a one ten. Yeah, they extended the wheelbase because the rear suspension's different. They're um, leaf over axle on the back, okay. and some of the, some of the measurements were adjusted, so they came out with a one ten uh, back in when did they come out? Sixty six, I think. Okay. Uh, I know. I'm pretty sure a few of those have made their way over to the to North America. So, oh, they're interesting. That's just reminding me. Um, quite a. I say quite a number. We're still talking tens rather than hundreds. But a fair few one tonners did go to places like, um, I think, Peru and Bolivia and places like that, sort of Central America. Obviously, left-hand drive vehicles. So if any of you guys are, like, exploring down there, it might be worth looking around. (laughs) I know I've seen, can't remember where it was, one of those countries, I did see a photograph of um, a station wagon, Series 3, 12-seat station wagon, on the, the deep rims so I, I can't. I, I imagine they came off one of those one tons that had been exported there. Good, <laughs> interesting. So they 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 may well still well well still be about. I, I suspect there's still still some in Africa as well. Actually, they had they had quite a few, in Ethiopia and Nigeria and stuff. So they got about. <laughs> Kenya got a got a large number, if I recall correctly. Is it Kenya? Yes, I think it did go to Kenya. Yeah. Does, yeah. That does sound for what good. use case? A military or commercial or what? Um, the Nigerian ones were military. As to the others, I, I don't know. I mean, they, I don't remember them being in military colours. So I, I imagine just commercial and industrial use. Yeah. Well, the, 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 of course, the 101 forward control was only a military vehicle, but but I think the, the others were available for both, weren't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The um, 2A and 2B forward controls uh, didn't do that well in the military. I think the South Africans had a lot of 2Bs. Okay. The, the, like, the British Army never really took them on. Well, of course, they, they had the 101 later, and, and that was their baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah which was a great vehicle. Um, if money was no object, I'd certainly have one. <laughs> yeah, looking at uh, your website, I found it here that Nigeria had 59 for Ministry of Defense and uh, Kenya had 14. So they ended production then with the Series 3 in around 77. Uh, was there any yeah. other future attempts to that you know of to bring back a, a, a one-tonner? Well, there was the... 
some of the high capacity pickups that came out in 1982 had uprated suspension and were rated as 1.3 ton. So that was kind of the, the closest thing they got. But uh, I know in the early 80s, Southern Electric, which were the biggest buyer of the one tons in in the UK, they approached Land Rover about reintroducing them. They said, no, we're not, not going to bring them back. But the discussions did eventually lead to the 127, which obviously Mike Gould uh, drew up. And he lives not too far from me. He's down south of Oxford. And um, I remember him saying that you had Southern Electric and a couple of other firms sort of wanted these uprated vehicles, and the 127 was the outcome of those discussions. So that that led from the lack of the one tonner. Yeah, I think the coolest truck that they never built would have been the 127 as a coil sprung forward control. Mm. I'm I'm sure people have built them since. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, parts is parts. You can build what you want, but I mean, that that would have been cool to see come out of the factory. Do you mean like the um, the llama? Uh, something the- like that. I'm I'm thinking basically the like the 101 FC built on a Defender platform and longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty been a good vehicle. I yeah. mean, I, I I think even the um, even the llama. You know, it's a shame they never built those. I mean, the the, the, the Pinsgauer did really well for Steyr. So if you put that on steroids, it's, you know, and put portals underneath it, that's what you have. Uh, but yeah. this was all during the age of the slow collapse of British Leyland. Well, and well the lack yes. Of money for investments. I is- understand the reasons why. I'm just saying that's like, the, if you want to dream about stuff and mm. the cool what could have been, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of like dream about stuff, I mean... I think it's a shame because the one ton ended in 77, we never got any with the V8. Right. Because how cool would that have been? A, a stage well, one V8 one tonner. That's why the 101 FC is so badass. Mm, yeah. Well, you would effectively have had a 101 with a standard Land Rover body. Right. You know, yep. because they do, they'd have presumably used the, the same engine and gearbox. Uh, which is Range Rover stuff anyway. And then the LC95. So, and the irony of that, of course, is they did build a vehicle just like that in about 1968, 69, because there's uh, Lulabelle, which they, when they, they took the two Range Rovers across the Sahara, and there was a 109 that went with them, which had a V8, an LT95, and 916 uh, Michelin XSs. And it looks totally badass, <laughs> and it's got the V8 in. So mm. again, a shame, you know, they didn't go down that line. Special vehicles to the rescue there. Yeah, I think it was them who built it. Yeah, I know uh, Roger Crayfon drove it, and there are photographs of it in his book. I don't know if you've seen, you know, the uh, Born in Lord Lane. Sure. So no, I I bought a copy of that from Canada. It's quite hard to get hold of, but that, that's got some pictures of it in there. No, that that's what I'd quite like to build a replica of that, or even better, find the original Lula Bell. But who knows where that is? It's not been on the road for a very, very long time, unfortunately. Someone's probably hiding it. Yeah, I think it was 1991. It was last on the road. So maybe it's in someone's shed somewhere, waiting to be discovered. <laughs> You know, we need know. we need to get Adam Bennett on the case. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I I have actually spoken to Adam Bennett about finding it. <laughs> oh, okay. He's the guy. You know, he's the yeah. guy. Yeah, because um, I mean, I don't know him well, but uh, I I do know him. I see him at the shows sometimes, and uh, okay. I did have I did have a drive of Oxford. He's he's oh. like a bloodhound with a big toolbox. Oh yeah, yeah. He's tr- he's tracking down a lot of quite interesting stuff. So so I hear. Plays his cards close to his chest, you know. Yeah, he does. You're but sp- the stuff he'll admit to is pretty impressive too. Oh yeah, yeah. You know the forestry truck and APGP number one. I mean that's just that's just cool without the Oxford truck. But add the Oxford truck, and that's an impressive collection. Yeah. Oh, very much so. Are they redoing the the Overland? Yes, it's but called. The, yes. Like, it, yes, from Singapore, are they? Correct. It's it's called the Last Overland, and that's uh, from yeah. Singapore back to London. And they'll be using the Oxford truck along with uh, two chase vehicle, two maybe three chase vehicles. 
and and Tim Slesser himself at the wheel. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. I've seen some bits about it, but I've um, I've been moving house the past couple of weeks. So I kind of missed a lot of stuff that's been going on. <laughs> Are you well, stay stay tuned because we interviewed them for the podcast. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I will do. Actually, you will have heard it last month. So. Oh. Yes. Okay, well then, go back and listen to an, a back episode. There we go. <laughs> we, rec- we record these things out of out of sequence sometimes, so it's hard for me to keep track of what's been aired and when. Right. Okay. Well, I'll uh, I'll make a note to uh, double check that one. Yeah. If you go out yeah. to lastoverland.com, then you can mm-hmm. track what's going on. They have a newsletter and they kind of keep you informed. They're also on Facebook, uh, Last Overland, uh, that they put the, they put some videos out there. But I think the official debut date. Uh, that they're departing Singapore, I think is August 28th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 25th. 25th. Thank you. They hope to be back in London within about 100 days. Let's get back to let's get back to the one tons. I I did a little checking while you guys were talking because I was kind of curious the difference between tonnage, and the British ton is considered the long ton which is 2,240 pounds. The U.S. ton is the short ton, which is a flat 2,000 pounds. And so those both, I guess, would be considered kind of imperial tons or standard ton. Metric ton is 1,000 kilograms, which is about... Which is 2,200 pounds. 2,204 pounds. And the metric ton is officially called the ton E, which is the T O N N E. And there you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So a little bit of a little bit of research for you while we're talking about the difference between tons, because I was always curious about that. The metric ton is just I, I like to think of it as just ten percent more than than an imperial ton. Oh, that's a good or way to look at it. An American ton. Yeah. It's a good way to look at it. And the metric is all base ten, so you know right. add ten. And it's actually very close to the to a British long ton. Right. So, Dan, of all the one tons, do you have a favorite or do you have maybe a top 10, top three? Do you mean in terms of the surviving vehicles? A- answer as you like. If we're including Lulabell as a one ton, then I think Lulabell is cool as hell. <laughs> kind of rhymes. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would be one. I mean, if, we, if we're going to have like my, you know, my one ton garage, Yes. If you like, yeah, Lula Bell would have to be in there. One ton number one, I mean, come on, it's number one. Although that one, from what I can gather, it, it didn't stay the same for more than about five minutes. They kept changing the rear bodywork, doing various things with it. It was There is a page on the site about it, and it was displayed with various different back bodies on, but that would be quite a nice one. And to that have. was the pr- first production? Yes. Okay. Either the first production or the last prototype, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, yeah, you could could look at it that way. It was on chassis, you know, two two nine double oh double oh zero one a. So well, it's just the way it's sort of Land Rover's mo to treat the first few production and and do like you say, try some different stuff on it. Well, so the, in that sense, it's like a production prototype. Yes, I mean, mine being a my one, you know, on my driveway is a chassis suffix A. So the the first 15 were chassis suffix A, and I think they were still doing some experimentation with those. So, yeah, you could, you could, it is kind of a development vehicle, I suppose. Yes, was the other one in in my garage would be mine, but fully restored. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Always a good dream. Always a good one. Uh, Yeah, both of mine, because I've got my, my Series 3 as well. I'd quite like, you know, I'd quite like to get the the last one hmm. but the last one would be difficult to kind of i don't know how you would decide which one was the last one because of the uk vehicles the highest chassis number was actually built earlier than a couple of lower numbers so uh-huh. i could pick there were like four or five vehicles built all on the same day which was the last day they made them so I could have one of those, or I could have the highest chassis number, or I could get one of the Nigerian ones, which were about a year later. So. Any one of those would make a good bookend next to number one. Exactly. So that 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 was my thinking. I, I'd actually one of the, one of the ones from abroad. I actually I think would be quite interesting. And I know as well. Is it Ethiopia? I think had some that were built in sand paint, which. I, that was probably my favorite color on a series. So that one of those would be very nice to have. Tell us more about Lula, Lula Bell. Well, Lula Bell, as I say, went across the Sahara with the two very early Range Rovers. In fact, they may have even been Vilas. So Lula Bell's, I think, was built in about 1962, 63. 
as a test vehicle. We think it was used as a prototype six-cylinder vehicle. It then ended up with a Buick V8 in it and the the Range Rover type gearbox. From the photos, it has Rover axles. It has the extra deep dish six and a half inch rims, so the the five six nine two or three, which is very very rare. And then it was running Michelin XS nine by sixteen tires. We know it was a bug eye. It had a standard Maltese cross grille that, for some reason, was projected forward. I guess to clear something in the engine bay. It then had the bug eye wings. It looks to have had a wooden bonnet at some point, like a slack <laughs> bonnet. I get the impression this thing was overheating like mad out in the desert. You think? Uh, yeah. And then, so what else? And she that's, was on That's the seat. sort of what happens when you try to put your own V8 into a series truck, by the way. Yeah, I, I imagine that. Would be, it might not so, be too bad in England because warmth is something a bit alien to us here. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, she was obviously specced up by Carawagon as well. So it's got a, a friend told me it's got a Carawagon roof rack on there. Neat. Is so, it, is it yeah, on your so website? Then, yeah, I think it's under prototypes. There's a page on their prototypes, I'm pretty sure that she's discussed on there. So so uh, the, the question in my mind is, did they build it as a way to support the development mule Range Rovers and to further test the Range Rover technology for Range Rover, or were they simultaneously considering putting it in the series? I mean, I know later they went with the Stage 1. I'm just wondering if they were trying to I, do something else, maybe. I think it was probably more towards the first part of your question. Okay. Uh, by the time Lula Bell was converted, we'd already had the 388-inch V8. We'd already had Goldenrod. I think the decision had already been made of we're not going to put the V8 into a Land Rover because they'd not long since put the six-cylinder into production. Um, and Lula Bell was also used for the gearbox testing for the Range Rover because right. Lula Bell did the plow testing. So 25 hours each in low first and low second towing a plow. So it, rather than use a Range Rover, they used Lula Bell. Okay. Yeah, so I think it was that. I, 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 I'm pretty certain by that time they'd... They'd kind of, the idea of a V8 Land Rover, I think, had been kind of put on the back burner a bit. So it was uh, more, it, of a tra- more of a transmission test mule then? Almost, yeah. I think it was just to sort of see how, how the engine and box would cope in various conditions. It may even have been the case with the two Range Rovers. Well, it made sense. If they've all got the same engine and gearbox, you only need one type of spares. There you go. You might take that argument as well. Did Lula Bell survive? Well, that's the big question, isn't it? Yeah. Certainly. It lasts on the road in 1991. Oh, that's right. You did say that. Yeah. I see the two pictures you have out here on the the website. It was, I mean, the factories, the factory sold her on in 1974 to, I think a guy's name was Dan Clayton. I think he he was one of the engineers at, at Rover. Um, at the time, so he he seems to have acquired it. Yeah, they get first crack at all the cool stuff. Well, they were doing years prior to that things. A lot of them that they had like 109 station wagons with three liter petrols in, which is another thing I, I wouldn't mind made, making an homage to. I always like the ones that are the fire tenders. I just I don't know why it seems a an appealing rover to doing something you know, like fire tending because you imagine in America all the fire tenders here are huge vehicles and you know, the Land Rovers typically are smaller. Yeah, well, that was why they were quite popular as fire conversions back in the day. Uh, and they're but, they're well suited to doing important things. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're they're an odd one because you you get people buy them who are into Land Rovers, but also people who are into fire engines, but not necessarily into Land Rovers, mm. so they they can be quite expensive, you know, because because they're generally in very very good condition, very low mileage, and you've got like two markets that are trying to buy them. It's a bit like military Land Rovers, you know. You get people who buy lightweights, you know, they're strong money these days. Well, have been for a long while because you've got Land Rover people want them, and you've got military fans who buy them. They're not massively into Land Rovers, but they want a military vehicle. Yeah, you get that extra market. 
funny on, on the subject of the values. I mean, I often get people tell me, you know, sort of asking me like, what's a one ton worth? And that's, I really struggle to answer that one. I, mean, I know that there is one on eBay at the moment as a project vehicle for, I think just shy of five and a half thousand pounds, which is pretty strong money for a project vehicle. I don't think it needs masses mm. doing. But yeah, it's still, it depends it's, on, on what the project needs, really. Yeah, yeah, it's it, bits of welding, painting. It's kind of complete, but a, but a bit. It's it's just been sat for a long time, sort of in a barn. It it may sell at that. It might not. I I really don't know. And now now just since we're a little, you know, the British market's a little bit foreign to us. Where mm-hmm. would say a contemporary uh, three quarter ton Land Rover? be price-wise relative to that for the similar kind of project? Well, I mean, I bought my... I've had it a few couple of years now, but I bought an 88-inch project a couple of years ago for £300. All right. <laughs> which was probably a bit further gone than this one is, but, yeah, you can, these days you can pick up probably a vehicle like what I bought. You'd probably be looking more like £1,000 now. And maybe uh, maybe double that for a 109. To be honest, 109s tend to go for slightly lower values here. Huh. Yeah, whereas well, over here, it's the other way around. Is it? Yeah. Well, yeah. there were fewer fewer long trucks imported into this country, so they're uh, they're, they're yeah. less common than the short trucks, and and so they bring yeah. more money. Everyone yeah, seems to think that uh, that Land Rovers are, are sort of these gigantic, massive vehicles. Everyone goes for a short wheelbase. But the short wheelbase really is such a small vehicle, mm-hmm. especially in know, America. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, that, the that, short that, the short trucks are popular for off roading because you wind through the trees better. Right? You, you know, just go through the woods in a 109 sometime, and you'll you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, I, I, I've I have in my one tonner over the years, so yeah, I, I do know what you mean. Especially in a 109 with a big box on the back. I, I have a Marshall ambulance. <laughs> oh, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least with mine, I've got the winch. So if I yeah. do get I can uh, pull myself out. <laughs> so, Dan, how did you get into the 110 community then? When I got into them, there wasn't such a thing as a 110 community, really. But it was... Basically, uh, Steve Graham was a guy a number of years ago. He restored a few, well, yeah, various rare Land Rovers, but he really got known for he bought Series 3 88 inch diesel number one and restored that. Okay. Which was one of the first, it, it's the first time I remember ever seeing a Series 3 that was treated like a Series 1. You know, he, he did it like all the details on it were were correct everything was sort of factory you know all the nuts and bolts were correct all this kind of thing he then was offered series three one ton number one so steve bought this he had this series three the one ton of number one which he had at some shows which i saw i mean a beautiful restoration in any case and then i'm thinking that looks like she you know it's quite beefy it's got these big wheels and tires on it and it's it's a real kind of muscular uh working truck yeah, I just thought I quite fancy one of those. And then I I asked around. Eventually one came up for sale that I bought. It was it was yeah, you know, trying to find parts and information on it that people just kind of shrugged their shoulders and no one really knew anything about them. How and long ago was that? It, um I bought mine in two thousand and five. And then how so, soon yeah, after that did the website get created? Maybe two or three years after. It was a little while after because I'd started um putting i remember i wrote to sort of all the land rover magazines and they published letters where i was asking you know does anybody own ones anyone know anything about them so that at that point people started getting in touch and uh, i was getting enough information to kind of collate it together into a site so yeah that it took a, a, a couple of years for that to come through i guess you got into the one ton community by getting a one ton and then building the community pretty much yeah <laughs> You are the community. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. It was like a little, a little niche, you know. So, so that makes you the mayor of one ten ton land. <laughs> <laughs> 
Does that mean I have to wear a hat or a like a big necklace or something? You, you have to wear <laughs> a, like that. a sash. You have to wear a sash. Yeah, a sa- yeah, sash will do. It's not too heavy. Have you always been into yeah. Land Rovers, or is this your first one? No, uh, when when I was a kid, we had the what's called the Cubs. You know, like the Scouts, but for younger kids. I don't know if you have it over there. Oh yeah, Boy we Scouts. Do. Yeah, we have no, Cub Scouts too. Yeah, oh, you have the Cub Scouts. Okay, so you know what yes. I mean. Oh yeah. Didn't that when kid and the guy who kind of ran the local branch where i grew up he bought a 90 which was back in the day when a, a coil sprung land rover was still quite new because it's a 1984 90 and i was only a, i don't know maybe seven or eight at the time so it wasn't that old um so he bought that and we would you know we'd go off on these camping trips and hiking trips and things, and this Land Rover would be there. So I remember being in that. And I, and also my father was an Austin Rover dealer when I was a kid. So I remember seeing them at his dealership. And they actually had a, a CWKY110 there, which they, you know, was actually used by the dealer, like mm-hmm. as a recovery vehicle. I, yeah, I kind of always been aware of them, and it was just when I knew it, you know, when I was a kid, it was like, yeah, I uh, I want a Land Rover, and then when I passed my test, I went out and bought a Series Three, so I had a, a Series Three eighty eight for a few years. Then I got the one tonner, and then these days I've, I've so I got the one tonner. I've got my sixty six eighty eight inch. I've got my Series Three, my seventy two, and my daily car is a one ten Defender. What year? Twenty eleven. Petrol or diesel? Oh, it's a, it's a diesel TDCI. So I've had it since new. Oh, wow. I bought it for my 30th birthday, so. Good for yeah, you. I've had, yeah. Had, had that for eight years now. It's just gone eight years old. And it's it's just an 86,000 miles. So it's not doing too bad. So it's just it's, broken in then. It's good to go. Yeah, pretty much. It's never had very much done. So it's had a set of tires on it, some servicing, and, and it did have a clutch. Does it? Uh, yeah. How well does it leak uh, oil? And how about water in the cabin? Does that? Does that? I want to make sure they've not improved things since my '87 110. It, it doesn't leak oil, <laughs> uh, but it does leak a bit of water into the cab. Okay, yeah. so so Which that they never I fix that think problem. Think well, the more things yeah. change, the more they stay the same. I mean. Uh, Maybe the new Defender will leak. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Well, you know, if you want it to be authentic, they they have to do it. Maybe it'll be like, yeah, uh, I'm like sure it will. Like and, maybe you know, if if anybody out there, you know, is gets a new Defender and is distressed by the lack of water leaks, just bring it to me. I'll punch some holes in <laughs> it. And we'll, right. we'll take care of you. <laughs> I wonder if they'll do like Ford does with the F one fifty, where they pipe in engine sounds into the into the cabin of the of the pickup, so you can you, you actually can hear the vehicle going because it's so quiet maybe a land rover will outfit a little tube and then you can push a button and you know, let that's, water and that's come technology the cabin. that ford got from their ownership of jaguar by the way oh okay nice nice so dan you live not too far from uh, from sully hall and and earlier you told us uh, before we start recording that you've actually seen a new defender on the road i've seen probably four or five of them knocking about i even one of them even waved at me i was in my works defender and i he, he i was came up to the roundabout junction and he was coming in and i i kind of half jokingly waved at him and he he did actually wave back because obviously i he understood that i recognized what he was driving now was it one of those kind of waves like he's acknowledging you or is it one of those wishful waves like he wished he was in something as cool as what you were driving <laughs> Uh, perhaps a little bit of both. Maybe a little of both. Okay. I'm, I'm taking that as a good I, sign that he knew, that you knew, that he knew, that you knew. I think I'm taking that as a good sign. Yeah, yeah. But I did put I put a couple of videos up um, on my YouTube channel where I'm talking about the new Defender and just some little observations I've had because I'm fairly sure they I don't think they're doing it just in terms of the same vehicle but different wheelbases. It definitely seems to me like they're different sized vehicles but with the same styling. That's how it seems based on the ones I've seen around. You've seen a number of them, I take it? I've seen sort of the equivalent to the 110 and the 90. So that's why I'm... Th- I, I just got the impression the 90 version is actually narrower than the 110. Oh, interesting. Okay. So well, that just, would help to preserve the proportions, I would think. Perhaps. It just seems to be a bit, just a bit more than a case of 
just shortening the wheelbase and taking the doors out, it, it just seems proportionally different somehow. You, you sure it's not clad, uh, extra cladding maybe that's on there? Or? It's hard. It's re- they're, they're, they're weird vehicles to get a sense of the size of them, actually. Yeah, they do that on purpose. I've seen driving around, I've not like stood by them and you know got up close. You haven't stalked any of them? Uh, kind of. Yeah, I did follow <laughs> one and tried to get some, some film of it, but it, it it just shot off. I think once you realize what I was doing. So right, right, yeah. They're kind of they're in this weird thing. They kind of want to say, "Hey, we're here, but we don't want you to pay too much attention to us." It's they, yeah, they're doing all that on purpose. That's all. Yeah, on they're purpose. they're just teasing us. Yeah. That's all they're doing. Yeah, That's all part of it, that. It's hype and teasing for sure. Yeah, they, they're doing a good job. Dan, you are our go-to guy in the Land Rover community for one ten Land Rovers. Is there uh, and one ton Land one ten? I keep saying one ten. See, that's just a one ten. You do keep month. saying that. Uh, for uh, uh, we'll start that again. Dan, want to thank you for coming on the show. You are now our. Go to guy for one ton Land Rover information, news, and community information. Where can people find you? You know what? What can they expect on uh, on the forum? Well, they can expect me tearing my hair out with my fifth, now fifty year old two A, uh, <laughs> which is which. Do you know what? Actually, it's nowhere near as bad as people think. It's actually been really reliable. I, I can be found at um, www.onetonlandrovers.co.uk. And from there, there's links to the Facebook pages, the Twitter, the YouTube. And I've, I've actually started recently getting more into like vlogs and, you know, the, the video uh, YouTube stuff. I've quite enjoyed doing that. So you can expect more of that. And obviously, as new videos, vehicles come out of the woodwork i'll upload them uh, onto the site and generally the updates i tend to do through twitter and facebook so you know always follow me there speak to me there and i'm always happy to speak to people you know any anything land rover related i'm i'm game for it and Bring if it, it any of our listeners think they have a, a one t- one ton or they know of one i guess the website's the best place to reach you to to pass that information on well absolutely the vehicle you've mentioned in canada i'd be interested in learning about we'll put dixon I'll on the case send, i'll send you some contact information for the chat fantastic yeah i'd love to hear from you about that yeah that vehicle's been down to the winter romp it's been to the ovlr birthday party it's been to a number of events on the east coast over the years though i haven't seen it in the past uh five to plus years Okay. Well, I know, um, is it Pangolin restored one of the prototypes, one with the hydraulic winch on? That would be out on uh, in Oregon on the West Coast, opposite side of the continent. I think it not long since broke contact, patch, or broke cover, actually. One of the magazines or something not long ago, but but in the States. Oh, I'll have to look. Yeah, it's, it's a bronze green truck cab with 916s and a hydraulic winch on. That, Sounds that, like a nice truck. Seems nice. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got photographs of it when it was in England, which are on the prototypes uh, page of the site. I'm, I'm fairly sure it's the same machine. Neat. You have to go, right, Dan? Yeah, I've got to head to work, unfortunately, but uh, it's been an absolute blast talking to you guys, and um, I really appreciate uh, you know you inviting me onto the show. I wish you all the very best and all success to you all. Thanks very much, Dan. Chatting with you briefly over the last uh, year or so, it's finally glad you could come on and tell us all about one tons. I got to get say one ton, not one ten. <laughs> one tons. Yep, been, been my pleasure. And that's the podcast for July 2019. I want to thank Dan for joining us, talking about the one-ton Land Rovers. If you know of a one-ton or you suspect one, make sure you let Dan know about it so he can keep track and and do do the good work of keeping track of these vehicles. Maybe there's more than just a dozen that are are running. Dixon, the one that you uh, referred to him from Nova Scotia, is it it still running? It was running as of just a couple of years ago. I haven't talked with the chap or, or seen him in the last couple of years, but it's certainly still there probably is still running around i also want to thank dixon for joining me today talking about the news no problem and also thanks to pax for his continued production support that's the one true pax for his continued production support visit our website centersteer.com to listen to previous shows and for show notes which have links to stories discussed in today's show we're part of the 4x4 radio network and i invite you to check out the other 4x4 related shows at 4x4 radionetwork.com you can connect with us on facebook twitter and instagram you can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer if you're not a subscriber to the show 
please do so. And that way you get the show automatically comes right into whatever podcast application you're using. As I've told you in the past, I recommend Overcast if you're using iOS device. You can show your direct support for the show by purchasing a t-shirt or a sticker. Just click on store on the menu at the top of our web page. Thank you for listening and we hope you enjoyed show number 76. Next month, we have a good conversation with Will of LR Workshop Fan. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. You may now resume your important things. I know Harold says something. I don't know what it is.